This is the city of Athens today, spreading over the plain of Attica. In the 5th century BC, however, two and a half thousand years ago, Athens was only the size of what we would call a small town. But it was to witness some of the most dramatic moments of the classical Greek world. One of these events occurred in 471 BC, when the citizens of ancient Athens were faced with a political crisis. They had to decide whether a man named Themistocles was to face the severe punishment of being exiled or ostracized from his city for 10 years. But Themistocles was no ordinary citizen. He was an Athenian hero of the recent Persian Wars and he'd been the city's leading politician for the past decade. For such a critical decision, 6,000 citizens had to be in the assembly to cast their vote. In the early morning, men would have hurried up these well-worn stairs that led to the Pinnix, or the assembly area of ancient Athens. In this assembly area, the Athenians voted on the laws that would govern their city-state or polis. This was democratic government in its earliest form. For the major assemblies that occurred ten times a year, citizens would come from both the city of Athens itself and from the surrounding region, both areas being part of the polis of Athens. At the Pinnix, men from many walks of life sat together on wooden benches, listening to arguments for and against Themistocles, as they decided which way they would vote. By noon, the debate had finished, and the 6,000 citizens made their decision. They did this by handing in a piece of broken pottery, with Themistocles' name scratched on it. And today, we still have some of these ancient ballot papers that may have been used on that fateful day. When these ballots were counted, the majority of the citizens had voted to exile Themistocles. Although he had not really done anything wrong, people had become suspicious of his power, and in a small place like ancient Athens, it was better to have him out of the city altogether. However, his exile was not as bad as we might imagine. Although he would have lost wealth and prestige in Athens, Themistocles was free to move to other city-states in Greece, where he would have found many things in common with his own way of life. He would have understood the language. People generally told the same myths and stories. They ate the same foods and lived in similar types of houses. Importantly, the Greeks also worshipped the same gods. And this, more than most things, was something that helped define Greek society, distinguishing it from the world of the barbarian, the Greek word for outsiders. Today, we can still get an idea of the importance of religion to the ancient Greeks from the many archaeological sites and artefacts that survive. Some in spectacular locations, like this temple at Cape Sunion, which is dedicated to Poseidon, the god of earthquakes and the sea. The ancient Greek gods, like Poseidon, seen here holding his trident, were often perceived in human form, and they had human characteristics, good and bad, and many Greek myths involve personal jealousies and rivalries between the gods. Religion, through its gods and its rituals, cults and festivals, provided a means of explaining the mysteries of life. Everything from how crops grow to why the earth shakes during an earthquake. These shared beliefs among the Greeks helped foster a sense of common identity, or panhellenism, that helped bind ancient Greek society together, even though the people themselves were divided into many different city-states. 
An element of Greek religion that we can observe today are the ancient temples, once the centerpiece of a religious sanctuary. People from a particular polis took an enormous pride in their religious sanctuaries, and these sanctuaries evolved to serve many different purposes. The town of Didyma is in present-day Turkey, over 300 kilometers from Athens. Yet Themistocles would have felt at home here, had he visited during his travels. The religious sanctuary at Didyma was dominated by a huge temple, sacred to the god Apollo. It was never fully completed, and it is built in what is known as the Ionic order of architecture, a building style that can be recognized by the scroll-like capitals at the top of the columns. Most ancient Greeks, regardless of where they came from, would have recognized this architecture. They would have also recognized many of the rituals and cults that were performed here in connection with the worship of Apollo. Because Apollo had the power of prophecy, his temples, like the one at Didyma, became the center of well-known oracles. Priests who went into a trance and spoke the words of the god, often giving clues to future events. This made the sanctuary at Didyma very wealthy, as people and city-states paid handsomely to hear what the gods had in store for them. Another religious sanctuary, this time on the Greek mainland, shows us how the Greeks would come together through worship of Zeus, the chief god of the Greeks. And while many ancient cities claimed a connection with Zeus, none is more famous than Olympia. At Olympia, ancient rituals to Zeus evolved into a week-long celebration known as the Festival of Zeus that also included the ancient Olympic Games. Because Zeus was the chief god of all the Greeks, whether they were from Athens or Didyma, all Greeks were welcome at Olympia, and the games evolved into a pan-Hellenic contest, or a contest for all people who spoke Greek as their mother tongue. For the actual sporting events, women were banned from attending, although at other times of the year, they too had sporting festivals that they held in honor of Hera, the wife of Zeus. The Olympic Games were held over five days, and for this period a sacred truce was called and all Greek wars were halted. The sporting competitions included track and field. Here a long jumper uses weights to gain extra distance. Horse racing and even foot races in full body armor. However, the prime event was always the fast sprint of one stadium length. Champions at the Olympic Games were crowned with wild olive branches and they became heroes of their particular city-state. The people at home were often so proud of their city's achievement that they would erect statues at Olympia so that their city-state would never be forgotten. However, not all people in ancient Greece were impressed by sheer sporting strength. As the poet Euripides says, garlands of leaves should be for the wise and good. Other religious sanctuaries were more local in their importance and were designed to reflect a city-state's civic pride. This temple is on the island of Aegina that lies just off the coast from Athens. It is built in the Doric order of architecture, a simpler and more robust building style than the Ionic order that came after it. Time has faded the bright colors in which these temples were once painted, and its fittings, landscaping and cult statue have long since disappeared but it still stands as a testament to Aegina's pride and place in the ancient world. Greek temples were not like our churches today, as most people would have never entered the building. It was primarily the house of the god and would have only been visited by priests. Instead of entering the building, people would have worshipped at an altar set up in the open air in front of the temple. 
On festival days, they would make appropriate offerings to the gods, and animals would be sacrificed, the meat shared by all the participants. Sometimes individual temples appeal to a particular group of people. In Athens, for example, is the temple of Hephaestos, the god of metal workers and craftsmen, shown here with a pair of tongs that would have been used when working with molten metal. Because Hephaestos's temple has been used as a church and later as a mosque, it is very well preserved and we can get a good idea of what these buildings look like when complete. This temple overlooks the Agora, the ancient marketplace of Athens. Close by were the foundries where metal workers and sculptors produced pots and pans, as well as bronze statues for rich clients. Given the dangerous nature of ancient bronze working, it certainly didn't hurt to have your workshop near the temple of the god who looked after your particular industry. Near the temple of Hephaestos is the famous religious sanctuary of the Acropolis, or Upper City. At the centre of this sanctuary is the Parthenon, acclaimed as the most beautiful of all the Greek temples. Fully complete in 432 BC, the Parthenon was built in honour of Athena, the god of wisdom and war, from whom the Athenians take their name. Her gold and ivory statue stood 13 metres high and would have glowed in the semi-darkness of the temple's interior. The building is superbly engineered and like the temple at Aegina, the Parthenon was originally decorated with sculptures painted in rich reds and blues, although much of this sculpture is now in the British Museum where it is known as the Elgin Marbles after Lord Elgin who removed them from the Acropolis nearly 200 years ago. Although the Parthenon was designed to be the centrepiece of the religious buildings on the Acropolis, it was a smaller temple, the Erechtheion, that was probably the most sacred of them all. This temple was sacred to both Athena and Poseidon. As a myth tells it, Athena and Poseidon once argued over control of the Acropolis, a contest that Athena eventually won. With the Acropolis hers, Athena agreed to share the temple with Poseidon, and she gave a valuable gift to the Athenians, the knowledge of how to grow and use the olive tree. Inside the temple stood a statue of Athena, carved out of olive wood, that had been worshipped for hundreds of years. Every four years, on the birthday of Athena, this statue received a new robe, woven by young girls especially chosen for the task. As the women of Athens took great pride in their weaving, to make the new robe for Athena's statue was seen as a great honour. This new robe was placed on the statue during one of the most important religious celebrations in ancient Athens, the Panathenaic Festival. Festivals such as this were not just for the Athenians. They were open to all, and they provided the chance for people to come together as Greeks, rather than members of a particular city-state. On the day of the Panathenaic festival, people first assembled at one of the gates of ancient Athens in an area known as the Keramikos. The city gate, only surviving as foundations, once had a fountain house beside it, and it was near this building that people gathered before setting off in a great procession towards the Agora and the Acropolis, along a road known as the Panathenaic Way that still survives in places. Cattle ready for sacrifice were herded along and rich young men of the city proudly rode their horses as a ship on wheels carried Athena's new robe through the city attended by followers wearing gold crowns and garlands of flowers. Another religious festival, technically under the control of Athens, but open to all Greeks, was celebrated in an elaborate ceremony known as the Eleusian Mysteries. 
Twice each year, the procession of the Eleusian Mysteries would pass through the Keramikos on its way to the town of Eleusis, 11 kilometers away, but still part of the city-state of Athens. Although modern Athens has spread all around the Keramikos, this area was once outside the ancient city and was used as a cemetery for important families. And today, the graves of the ancient Greeks along with sculptured headstones and portraits, still line the road down which this procession passed. At its destination in Eleusis was a site sacred to the myth of Demeter, possibly one of the most ancient of the Greek myths. The myth tells how the daughter of Demeter, Persephone, was abducted to the underworld by the god Hades. Searching for her daughter, Demeter arrived at Eleusis, where she declared that no crops would grow on earth until Persephone was given back to her. Finally, Zeus ordered Hades to release Persephone, but because she'd eaten pomegranate seeds in the underworld, she had to return to Hades for a third of each year. Nevertheless, Demeter was happy to have her daughter back and she made a gift to humanity of wheat seeds and the knowledge of the plough. But since Persephone must return to the underworld for a part of each year, no crops will grow during this time. And in this way, the myth explains how people learn to farm the soil and why crops wither and die during the hot months of late summer in Greece. The Eleusian mysteries were to celebrate the gift of Demeter, and they lasted nine days in all, the same length of time that Demeter searched for her daughter. The highlight of the festival was a torch-lit procession to the centre of the sanctuary, where people would be initiated into the mysteries. This model of ancient Eleusis shows the site crowded with lavish temples and buildings, an indication of its importance to the Greeks. Today we have to be content with foundations and a few courses of wall, but the rock-cut steps where the initiates sat as they witnessed the great mysteries can still be seen. From these steps, the initiates would have witnessed a dance acting out the myth of Demeter, and they would have been shown ancient cult objects. The most sacred was known as the ear of corn in silence reaped. However, it was forbidden to tell outsiders anything about the rituals and objects. And in the hundreds of years that the Eleusian mysteries were carried out, we still do not know for sure what went on. Another religious festival enjoyed by people from all over the Greek world was the Drama Festival. And this too had its origins in the very early history of Greece. Long before Themistocles' day, at the beginning of each summer, when the harvest was in, Dionysus, the god of wine and vegetation, would be worshipped, along with a lot of drinking, music and dancing. As these harvest festivals grew in complexity, dancers were performed telling stories about the life of Dionysus. As time went by, one of the dancers was given some special lines to recite, and in doing so, they became the world's first actor. Later, another actor was added, then more, until finally, plays as we know them were performed. True to its origins, the patron god of theatre throughout the Greek world was Dionysus, and it's fitting that one of the oldest surviving theatres is the Theatre of Dionysus at the base of the Acropolis in Athens. This theatre, first used in the early 5th century BC, replaced a wooden structure in the Agora that had burnt down. And here, against a backdrop of wood and canvas, were performed many of the masterpieces of Greek drama. By Themistocles' day, tragedies, comedies and satyr plays were performed as part of a week-long drama festival known as the City Dionysia. Themistocles himself probably sat in the audience here and watched a play by Aeschylus called The Persians, 
that told the story of his great victory over the Persian navy a few years before. This play would have involved several main actors who played different roles throughout the play, their masks telling the audience exactly what character they were acting at the time. Along with the actors was the chorus, a group of performers who recited the story in poetic verse and who would provide the audience with the setting and mood of a scene. They performed in the semicircular orchestra of the theatre, a memory of when long ago people first danced stories from the life of Dionysus. Festivals in all their variety brought the Greeks together and while some were purely for men, others were for women, and yet others involved everyone, including the children and slaves. And because of things like religious sanctuaries and festivals that all Greeks held in common, it meant that while Themistocles could be banished from Athens for ten years, he was not banished from the society of his people. While the ancient Greek gods stopped being worshipped a long time ago, our world reminds us that religion is still a powerful force in bringing people together and making them feel like they are members of a particular society. Even little aspects of ancient Greek religion can still be experienced today, especially the dim-lit and smoke-filled atmosphere that would have been part of ancient religious ceremony. The links between past and present become clear when we observe this Christian service while listening to the words of the poet Euripides, as he describes the sensation of being in an ancient temple. Smoke of Arabian frankincense streams upward to the temple's height. Some things change only a little. <laughs> 